Hello and welcome. Today I am joined by Nicole McLaughlin, who is a counter fraud specialist. So welcome. Thank you, Sam. Right. So first, what what does a counter fraud specialist do? What's your role? Um, I'm a local counter fraud specialist for Hillingdon, um, and my role is basically to um, make every effort to reduce fraud to a minimum in in the NHS. So, um, anything that takes money away from the organisation would be something that I would be expected to look at, and I do that by conducting a range of activities. Um, so, I would um, try and prevent fraud from happening by speaking to staff, telling them what fraud looks like, um, telling them, you know some little stories about investigations I've undertaken um, just so we're all clear that you know if you do commit fraud then there may well be um, consequences so I just sort of do quite a lot of fraud awareness work and then obviously I also um, conduct exercises to prevent fraud from happening in high risk areas for example working with procurement or HR teams to identify where there's a risk of fraud and then see if I can do any work around that area to prevent fraud from happening and lastly, probably what people think I do all the time, and I do obviously do quite a lot of it, is actual investigations. So people make referrals to me um, either anonymously or, or um, you know, via email or, or, or ring me up and tell me what their concerns are. And then we discuss it and then I may conduct an investigation into the allegation. But it's not in order to prove fraud. It's just to establish the facts of, of what's happened. So what are some of the most common types of fraud that you'd expect to see in an organisation like the NHS? So at the moment, we have a, um, a fraud of the day, if you like, is um, working whilst off sick. And this is where people um, either submit fit notes saying they're too unwell to come to work for, for Hillingdon or, or their organisation and yet are working somewhere else. So they're getting paid sick pay and they're also getting paid a salary or, or some um, temporary shift money from, from their other occupation. Um, they may also have a existing fit note and they might write over it and change the date so they can get the fit note used twice. So we're seeing quite a lot of that. Um, we're also seeing quite a lot of people who have secondary employment and it's overlapping with their NHS employment. So they're not working their contract hours for the NHS um, and effectively they may well be running two full-time jobs which you know physically is possible you know that would only be a 15 hour a day um, but it doesn't leave a lot a lot of time for life in between if you're working 15 hours five uh, days a week and generally speaking the managers are unaware that these people do actually have secondary employment that is also full-time um, a lot of the managers I speak to were quite clear or are quite clear that they're expecting their staff to work Monday to Friday nine to five attend meetings come into the office um, etc etc and they can't be doing that for two separate um, employers it's, it's physically impossible there may well be occasions where you know you could have a weekend job or something in the evening and that's absolutely fine as long as it doesn't physically overlap with your main primary employment which we would class as our employment with Hillingdon. And I think you also mentioned procurement as quite a high risk area for fraud so if people are working they, they are someone who procures things for the organisation what should you be aware of in terms of looking out for fraud? Procurement is considered to be a really high risk um, in the NHS. We procure everything. We procure goods, services, staff. We're always building things, always repairing things, always maintaining things. So there's a real risk that fraud could occur um, with respect to inappropriate relationships with suppliers. Um, so that's like a pre-contract um, fraud where you may be asked to uh, get some quotes or, or, you know, get some, um, you know, how much is this piece of work going to cost us? And you may well know the supplier. It may well be your company and you've never declared that you have an interest in the company that you're trying to bring on board. Um, after the contract's in place, we're at risk of fraud because the work could be not what we asked for. Um, it could be using um, different materials. So we're getting not what we're paying for. We're getting cheap cheap material rather than the material we may have paid for and um, we also could be um, provided with duplicate invoices or invoices for work that hasn't been undertaken at all um, yeah so basically you know our staff are um, or staff in procurement teams it's really important they declare any potential declarations of interest because the perception that they might be having a conservatory put on the back of their house for free by one of our contractors is something that is quite an easy allegation to make um, and it's the sort of thing that you know gets referred to us quite a lot and generally speaking it's pretty easy to have a look at that kind of thing you know you drive past someone's house and just have a look and see if there's a there's a contractor van parked outside with the name on and then you just sort of make a phone 
phone call. So there's a huge risk of fraud. Um, the actual number of referrals related to procurement fraud is relatively low because we do have good um, you know, systems in place to prevent fraud from happening. But there's always an inherent risk of any kind of fraud happening, um, not just procurement fraud. So what are the kind of things that might motivate someone to commit fraud? Um, generally speaking, you can't just to be clear, you can't commit fraud by accident. You have to know that you're being dishonest and you have to intend to cause a loss or make a gain for yourself or another. So you can't just, um, you know, if you if you have a timesheet and you accidentally, you know, you might complete your timesheet in advance and then you, you might be sick a day and then you might submit your timesheet and forget that you've already pre-completed it and then you submit it and you get paid for a shift you haven't worked as long as you then say oh my goodness you know I've made a mistake I need to get that timesheet removed and then there will be some kind of local arrangement to to offset the um, overpayment so that that's generally what fraud is but the people who, who tend to commit fraud fraud in the NHS are generally opportunists they've seen a they've seen a weakness and they're trying to exploit that weakness um we don't tend to get people who come into the organisation deliberately intending to commit fraud from the outset. So we're not um, we have very good, um, robust, probably fairly onerous recruitment procedures in terms of, you know, reference checking, um, ID checking, you know, et cetera. So we, we're quite robust on allowing people into the organisation. Once you're in the organisation, then, you know, you're often in a position of trust quite quickly. You'd often have access to, um, you know, high value goods, um, you know, signing off, you know, documents, et cetera. So once you're in here, some people see that as an opportunity to commit a fraud. Um, Currently, because of the um, cost of living crisis, we're definitely getting what we would call um, need, not greed. You know, people are genuinely short of money and are unfortunately thinking, well, the easiest way to sort of resolve my issues is maybe to steal from my employer. And I would imagine that's the situation that is um, is common across all employers at the moment. They're just generally um, they reckon the studies reckon that, you know, every organisation is losing 5% of their turnover to fraud. That figure may well increase because of the current climate, because I mean, some people's mortgages have gone up by a thousand pounds a month and people are genuinely struggling and there's not obviously much support for people in full time employment. So I would say that most people who commit fraud are maybe need the money, although there are obviously people who don't need the money who are just, you know, financially motivated to want more money than they actually have. And um, so I would call that greed, not need. Um, other people who commit fraud are people who maybe think they're a little bit cleverer than they are. You know, everybody that I obviously catch up with the people who aren't as clever as they think they are. Um, so, you know, generally people who commit fraud think they've spotted a weakness that no one else has spotted. Um, but generally our systems are fairly, um, you know, we have internal auditors, we review things. It might not come out immediately, but, you know, it'll catch up with you at some point um, exactly what you've been up to. And if you um, did it by accident, you know, we can sort it out. But if you genuinely intended to do it, then obviously our, our um our approach is always to look at all available sanctions in order to address the loss and uh, and deal with the situation. So are there any kind of red flags or signs that people should look out for um, that would help them identify that fraud might be taking place? There's always red flags and they're always with the benefit of hindsight. You think, oh, I should have I should have known that, um, but never be sort of. Um, embarrassed that you didn't spot that one of your close colleagues was committing fraud it's not it's not really your job to go around suspecting you know that your colleagues are being dishonest it's you know it's your job to if you spot a, a concern then to bring it to my attention or, or your manager's attention unless they're obviously the person you've got the concern about but generally speaking um, studies have shown that there are some red flags and some of them are fairly obvious for example someone's lifestyle suddenly changes significantly they start driving you know a Lamborghini to work or they start buying um, second properties and renting them out and they haven't inherited any money and they haven't won the lottery they just obviously have found some kind of additional source of income that may be fraudulent so I would say a lifestyle change may be a red flag but obviously there are legitimate reasons for people having a lifestyle change um, we also uh, notice that some people who commit fraud have um, never take all of their annual leave so they're always there they're there in the morning first thing they're there last thing at night obviously in the NHS that's a little bit more tricky because people do genuinely work very long hours because um unfortunately you know we're under a lot of pressure at the moment but sometimes when you look back you think because they were always there they were always on top of something as nobody else got an, got an opportunity to see what exactly was going on if you're not taking all your annual leave 
then nobody's ever really covering for you and can see exactly what is happening when you're not there because you're always the person who's shielding whatever it is you're doing. Um, we don't generally tend to find that people have got previous criminal convictions. As I said earlier, it tends to be um, opportunists and the NHS who spot a system weakness. Um, but yeah, most people who commit fraud, um, there may well have been a sign that something wasn't quite right. Um, but generally, Unless we're doing a proactive exercise to look for fraud, most pe most fraud is reported to me by colleagues. They they just spot something that doesn't seem quite right, and it could be something as obvious as finding a pay slip on the printer, um, which shows an inordinate amount of overtime. And you're thinking, well, you never did any overtime, so how can you be claiming overtime? Well, they might find a timesheet, and they think that's not my signature. Someone's forged my signature. So generally speaking, fraud comes to light because some other people are being observant. Um, and obviously we do do data matching exercises. We participate um, in the National Fraud Initiative, which is a cabinet office run exercise. So twice a year, all public sector bodies submit their data. Um, it's all run through the, you know, the software and it and it sp sp you know, spews out copious amounts of reports that we then work through. And that will identify potentially um, duplicate invoices, people working whilst off sick, people who haven't declared directorships in companies that we are actually contracted with, et cetera. So there's a lot of preventive or detection going on but generally it's people's just being observant and that's really what I would like to sort of if if at the end of this um this discussion nobody remembers anything that I've said which you know is absolutely fine um but if you could just remember my name and if you have a concern to come and tell me then that's really all that I would ask for just you know remember that every single organization has a person like me within it that you can report your concerns to so brilliant. So just if anyone sees anything, come to you. <laughs> yes. But it, and obviously it's not my job to find fraud, but, you know, and, and there may well be local arrangements that, you know, are in place that, you know, you may not be party to. And that's fine. As I said earlier, I don't, I'm not looking for fraud. I'm just looking to establish the facts. And then if if there is something that isn't right, then I will gather the evidence um, from other staff, take some statements, look at some documents, and then I'll ask the person in for an interview and we'll have a discussion and they'll be shown the evidence and they'll be asked to provide an explanation and then hopefully it can all, you know, be resolved nicely without anyone ever <laughs> going through a disciplinary. Unfortunately, <laughs> that isn't always the outcome that happens. Oftentimes people are committing fraud and we've got the evidence. Unfortunately, you know, they get they lose their jobs or or they may even be prosecuted if it's um if it's extremely serious. And that's obviously something that the trust is very keen to um, follow up on because we, we really want to deter people from committing fraud and if you know that if you commit fraud in your core and you're, it's proven that you've done it you might lose your job then obviously that may well deter you from making that decision in the first place it's much cheaper to deter people from committing fraud than to investigate fraud <laughs> brilliant well thank you so much for your time today um it's been lovely talking to you my pleasure thank you very much